What if you have $1,000 to spend on an off-grid solar system? A subscriber recently asked me this question. I need a reliable system that can run a fridge when the grid is down. And it has to be recharged with solar power. Here's what I came up with. Stick around to see how long you can run the appliances and why the system is perfectly sized. Let me take you behind my screen and talk about the details of the system. We have a 12 volt 100 amp hour battery for $187, a 2000 watt inverter which is UL listed and has a ground fault current protector built in for $288, four 100 watt solar panels that are wired in series for $198, a Victron 150 35 amp MPPT charge controller for $165, solar cables $17, charge controller cables $14 and battery cables $31. The fuses and breakers in the system will cost you $77. The total cost of the system will be $977. This is under the requested $1000 budget. But what can you run with this system? We typically aim for 2 or 3 days of autonomy for off-grid systems, which is how long the system can run without the sun recharging the battery. So your battery size should be 2 or 3 times your daily energy consumption. If you consume 1 kWh of energy daily, your battery must be between 2 and 3 kWh. Let me show you how to calculate for this system. The battery we are using has a nominal voltage of 12.8 volts and is 100 amp hours, which means we have a total battery capacity of 1280 watt hours or 1.28 kilowatt hours. Let me show you the runtime based on my fridge. My fridge is rated at 80 watts and uses 640 watt hours per day. It has a duty cycle of 30%, meaning the compressor is on for 8 hours a day. If we divide the total battery capacity of 1280 watt hours by the consumption per day, which is 640 watt hours, we get 2 days of runtime. This was a quick explanation. I recommend checking out my full video on the topic. The following example is a TV. It consumes 60 watts. Can you guess how we calculate the total runtime? Again, we divide the total battery capacity in watt hours by the TV's power consumption. So it becomes 1280 watt hours divided by 60 watts equals 21 hours. Some people who are advanced with off-grid designs might have spotted a flaw in these previous calculations. To be completely accurate, we must slightly increase the power consumption. This is because the inverter is not 100% efficient. Most inverters are 90% efficient. So the 60 watts from the TV will draw more than 60 watts. So we must divide the power rating by the efficiency to become 60 watts divided by 0.9 equals 67 watts. The new runtime is now 1280 watt hours divided by 67 watts equals 19 hours. I made it easy for you by designing a free tool on my website. Just fill in your appliances, their consumption and the time they will be on. Then you get a result that shows you the amount of batteries and solar panels you will need. The link will be in the description. Let me explain why I chose these components and show you how the whole system is balanced. First up, the solar panels. Why did I choose 400 watts? On average, 
people have three sun hours. Now you might ask, what are three sun hours? I have five hours of sun a day. Let me explain, because this is often confusing. One sun hour equals 1000 watts per square meter of solar irradiation. When the sun shines in your backyard, it might only be 600 watts per square meter. Solar panels are tested at 1000 watts per square meter. So if you look at the back of the solar panel, it says it's rated for 100 watts. But that's only at 1000 watts per square meter. This is why people rarely get their rated power out of the solar panel. If you have 600 watts per square meter solar irradiance, your 100 watt panel will only deliver 60 watts. My subscriber is located in Atlanta, Georgia. These are the sun hours he has available. We can see that December has the lowest figure of the year, with an average of 3.43. I went with 400 watts of solar panels, because you can recharge the battery in one day with 3 sun hours. With 400 watts of solar energy, we will produce 1200 watt hours of energy per day. The formula goes like this. 400 watts of solar panels times 3 sun hours equals 1200 watt hours. If you live more up north, the sun hours will decrease, especially in winter. I recommend using a generator to recharge your batteries during this time. Now that the solar panels are sized, Let's size the cable that will carry the power from the solar panels to the charge controller. I have calculated the wire thickness from the solar panels to the charge controller. They need to be 12 gauge. So I will include that in the part list. I have made a video about how to figure out the thickness of the wire according to the length. Explaining it in this video would take too long. We also need a disconnect switch to isolate the solar panels from the system. We can install a 10 amp DC circuit breaker right before the charge controller's input. Let's move on to sizing the charge controller. The best way to wire the panels is in series, because that's how we reduce the thickness of the wire and the voltage drop, which will make the cables cheaper. Wiring the panels in series will increase the voltage. So let's figure out what the maximum expected voltage will be. Each panel has a VOC or volts open circuit of 22.7 volts. So 22.7 volts times 4 panels equals 90.8 volts. Next, we need to add a safety factor of 1.25. Do you remember? that one sun hour is 1000 watts per square meter and the solar panels are rated as standard test conditions of 25 degrees or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Imagine it's a cold winter day with full sunshine and no clouds. It could be that these conditions are better than the standard test conditions. So the panel could produce 120 watts. This is because the cold temperature improves the efficiency of the panel. If we multiply the voltage of 90.8 volts with a safety margin of 1.25, we become a total voltage of 114 volts. Now, we need to decide the current of the charge controller. This one is easy. Divide the solar panel's total power by the voltage of the battery. We become 400 watts divided by 12.8 volts equals 31 amps. We need a charge controller with an input voltage rating higher than 114 volts and a current higher than 31 amps. So we choose the Victron 150 35 MPPT. You can also select a 30 amp charge controller. I recommend not running the charge controller at 100% because this will heat up the controller, and heat is the enemy of longevity. Next up 
is the sizing of the fuse and cable from the charge controller to the battery. According to the Victron manual, we must choose a fuse between 40 and 45 amps. So we will use a 40 amp MRBF fuse, because it's easy to mount on the battery terminal. I recently made a video about these fuses. Now, we need to select a cable that can carry at least 40 amps. This is an 8 gauge or 10 mm square cable. I will link the cable in the description as well. It already has ring terminals, so you don't need to add these. I recommend crimping some ferrules on the end, which goes to the MPPT. The same as with the solar cables in the DC breaker and solar input on the MPPT. Let's calculate the fuse and wire size for the inverter. An inverter is not 100% efficient, it's more like 90%. If the inverter delivers 2000 watts on its output, the input power will be higher. For a 2000 watt inverter, with 90% efficiency, this becomes 2222 watts. Next, we figure out the maximum current draw. That's 2222 divided by 12 volts, and we get 185 amps. Then we multiply with a safety factor. We multiply 185 amps by 1.25, and we get 231 amps. If we round these up, the closest fuse rating is 250 amps. Now we need to find a cable that can handle at least 250 amps. This is a 1 odd or 50 mm square cable. I have linked all the cables in the description, so you don't have to crimp the lux. If you are experienced with off grid solar design, you might have noticed something unusual in the system. Can you spot the issue? The high current draw from the inverter and the 100 amp BMS inside the battery. The BMS, or battery management system, regulates the current entering and leaving the battery. It's designed to protect the battery by limiting the current to 100 amps, which ensures safety and longevity of the cells inside. But what does it mean for the system? If we draw 100 amps at 12 volts, that equals a maximum power draw of 1200 watts from the battery, but our inverter is 2000 watts. If you try to run a continuous 2000 watt load, the battery will likely shut down to prevent damage. Let me explain why we go for a slightly larger inverter. Remember that my subscriber asked me to run a fridge? Knowing that the fridge has an inrush current to start a compressor, we must account for this. You might think that the BMS will shut down if more than 100 amps is drawn from the battery. I have tested this myself, and the BMS has surge power capability, meaning it will deliver a larger current for a few seconds, more than enough for the surge power demand. If you want to run a continuous 2000 watt load, the solution is to add another battery in parallel. This way, you will increase the available current and prevent overloading the BMS. You can also get a 12 volt 200 amp hour battery with a plus BMS. This means that the BMS can continue to deliver 200 amps of current. I have made a video on how to wire and fuse batteries in parallel, so check it out if you are interested. When we connect the inverter to the battery, you can expect a spark. If you can, use a small resistor to pre-charge the capacitors in the inverter. The spark itself is not bad for the appliance, it might just scare you. Regarding the connection sequence, connect the battery to the charge controller first, then connect the solar panels to the charge controller and turn on the breaker, then connect the inverter to the battery. I will post the system with all the components on my website, where you can find all kinds of free diagrams. It will be the first link in the description. If this video was helpful, please give it a like. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.